radial nerve examination. The radial nerve leaves the posterior cord and runs around the spiral groove of the humerus after coming through the triangular interval. At this point, the branches to the triceps are already running as separate nerves and are often not damaged by injuries to the radial nerve at this level. Those triceps, or three heads, are, can you, t can you tense, that's perfect, the medial head, down here at the bottom, the lateral head, and the long head. And the radial nerve runs in a, a spiral uh, groove around this part. So the first branch, triceps. The next branch, as the radial nerve runs down, is the brachioradialis. This muscle just here is examined by resisted elbow flexion in the, with the hand in mid-prosupination. So as you bend up the elbow, you see brachioradialis coming up here. And the radial nerve will lie in that groove between the brachioradialis and the brachialis. The ra radial nerve in many people innervates half of that brachialis, but reliably always innervates the brachioradialis. After running down here, the next branch is the extensor carpi radialis longus, ECRL. This inserts here at the base of the index finger metacarpal and extends and radially deviates the wrist. The wrist normally is extended straight in the middle, and we'll come to that in a minute, but the, the action of this muscle radially deviates and extends. And we can feel that muscle just after, if we just tense the arm just once again, you can see brachio. Um, radialis, you can see ECRL just here. So fingers on ECRL and ask Louis just to bring the wrist back and it stands out beautifully there. So this is ECRL, a radial nerve muscle. Exactly after this point, the radial nerve then branches. It runs into its long sensory branch, the superficial radial nerve, that runs down the forearm all the way to bring sensation to this first web space. It can be quite a small or quite a large area, but always over that first web space. And the other branch is the posterior interosseous nerve. The posterior interosseous nerve is the function of uh, wrist and finger extension. And its first branch is either at the PIN, the posterior interosseous nerve, or slightly before is the brachio, is the extensor radialis brevis. That inserts onto the base of the middle finger metacarpal and therefore pulls the wrist up into centralised wrist extension. Louis, can you pull your wrist up and I'll just fight you? And we can see that muscle belly just here. We can have branches down to supinator, which is the muscle through which the two heads um, of supinator runs this posterior interosseous nerve. And supinator lies just here underneath that mobile wad. And we're going to ask Louis to to turn his hand, I'm going to resist that, and you can see supinator just here. Mobile wad on top, supinator here. And the radial nerve is running underneath that mobile wad through that muscle, supinator, to then innervate the rest of the uh, wrist extensors. After that is EDC, extensor digitorum communis. That is an extensor of the MCP joints, the metacarpophalangeal joints, and it brings the fingers out straight can often be confusing in that the ulnar nerve will extend the interphalangeal joints. So it's good to ask the patient to extend the clawed hand like this. Then we bring those fingers back and you can see the tendons. If you just hold your wrist straight, now bring those back. You see the tendons of EDC here. And again, that muscle belly really clearly. The PIN, the posterior interosseous nerve, also extends index finger and little finger independently in the rock-on uh, posture. The muscles to the uh, extensor digitorum brevis and extensor indices lie on opposite sides here of EDC. And then we come to the extensors and abductors of the thumb. So we have the abductor pollicis longus. Louis, can you pull your thumb all the way out and about? We can see the EPL tendon is just here. And across the other side from the, um, the anatomic snuff box, extensor pollicis brevis and the abductor pollicis longus. And these two tendons form the radial side of the anatomic snuff box. All of these muscles, again, are innervated by the posterior interosseous nerve. The EPL comes around Lister's tubercle 
and forms part of the third compartment, and that's what gives it that oblique course. The other two run in the first compartment and run just across the wrist. All of these extending the fingers and the thumb and the wrist. The radial nerve. Radial nerve palsy. When the radial nerve is damaged, we often, as mentioned before, maintain triceps action. But triceps is an incredibly useful and functional muscle. If you try and reach up and above without triceps, the hand just falls and hits you in the face. So triceps is incredibly functional for reach, for extension, for transferring, taking yourself up off a chair or from bed to chair, and for stabilising things on a table. When you have just the weight of your arm, triceps allows you to push down and stabilise even more. So triceps is a very useful functional muscle, but is often maintained because the injuries are beyond the point where that takes its innovation. So what we lose with a radial nerve palsy is extension of the wrist and extension of the fingers. We don't often miss brachioradialis because we've got very strong elbow flexors, and so we don't notice the fact that we've lost brachioradialis. But we do notice the loss of wrist extension. Because if I ask Louis to grip my fingers, the first thing he does is he stabilises the wrist in neutral or even slight extension. And I can't escape from that grip. But if I put Louis's grip in the position down here where it would be in a wrist drop and asked him to grip me now, he's very much weaker. Because he doesn't have that ability to put the, all of the flexors on the mechanical advantage to get the best strength. So you want a strong grip, you want a stable and extended wrist. So the first thing that we notice is we've lost that and thus any grip is weak. We've also lost the ability to release. So again, as I bring Louis's hand up, you see the tenodesis effect of the fingers coming into the palm. The only way he could release from here is to use his EDC and his other extensors. And if he had a large object in there and no radial nerve, he wouldn't be able to release. The only way he can do is by using the tenodesis effect. As the radial nerve recovers, we would test with a tenel, and we tap from the uh, distal territory all the way along the nerve, up around the spiral groove, up to the top. If we'd had a degenerative injury here, and we see that regenerative tide progressing down the nerve, we would notice that the tenel sign, each time we checked it, would be progressively along the arm. The first muscle that we would notice uh, returning would be the brachioradialis. And again, that would be resisted elbow flexion, hands just here feeling for that muscle contraction. Then we would notice a radially deviated wrist extension coming back. So after the wrist drop, the wrist wouldn't come back in a normal centralised uh, posture, but would be over to the radial side through the unopposed action of ECRL. And we can see that tendon here and the muscle there. Next, that wrist extension will centralise as ECRB returns. And we will then, about a month later, notice the return of the finger extensors. And often the last function is that of thumb abduction and extension. So this would be a normal, progressive, degenerative recovery that would go step by step along that train line, re-innovating the stations as it goes with brachioradialis, ECRL, radial extension, central uh, wrist extension when ECRB returns, subsequently finger extension, and then finally thumb. Radial nerve palsy examination.